good morning. I would like to first start by saying thank you to everybody that's joining us today. We have an incredible webinar for you all. Um, and I'm so excited that you decided to spend your Saturday morning with us. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start. So today we have a wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Samuel Wood. Um, and if you've you know, done your research in the fertility realm or you know, thinking about ovarian rejuvenation, um, I'm sure that this is a name that you've heard and seen a lot of. And so again, I'm so excited to be speaking about him. So Dr. You know, truly a unique fertility specialist and scientist. He has been, you know, voted top doctor and in the U.S., um, America's top doctors. He's been rated superb, super doctor. Um, he's the only fertility specialist in the world honored as the who's who um, and the who's who in America as well, and the who's who in science and technology. Um, and, you know, he's received so many awards. Um, he's a distinguished humanitarian and um, 50 people to watch. Um, not only all of that is really, really impressive, but he's also certified as a high complexity laboratory director um, for, you know, reproductive genetics. That's PGS, PGD, um, definitely some tests that give you incredible information about embryos very early on. Um, he's been featured in New York Times, BBC Newsweek, and over 100 different television shows and radio programs. Um, he's truly a specialist in clients with low prognosis um, and, you know, offering very unique protocols. So each protocol that like the video says, and I'm sure Dr. Wood will touch on, each patient is unique and they are treated as such here. So, you know, we're really, really excited about that. Um, he uses PRP, uh, NPLAF, Ultra, you know, these types of ovarian rejuvenation to, um, you know, th this is enhancing and turning back time on fertility. Um, and so he's also the medical director and president of Gen5 Fertility, which we are so, so excited to have him. And, um, you know, today he's going to be talking about ovarian rejuvenation with a little bit of extra. And I am really, really excited for you all to hear about this. We love Dr. Woods so much here and we are so fortunate to work with him. He is an incredible doctor and uh, you guys will all see his passion and, um, you know, all the knowledge that comes behind everything he says. And so without further ado, I am so excited to welcome Dr. Samuel Wood and have him talk a little bit more about what he is truly passionate about and you know what he is, I think, born to do. So we are all so, so thankful. Good morning, Dr. Wood. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. And I'm going to see if I can make this happen here. <laughs> awesome. We have incredible guests with us today. We have an outstanding group here. And uh, please tune in and stay till the end. We will answer as many questions as we can. And um, there is also an incentive for everybody. So there's a nice discount that we will be offering as well. So without further ado, I'm super excited. Dr. Wood, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, I look forward to hearing about this extra. Thanks again. And, and th thank you all for being here. I know it's a weekend, but you know, this is the most important area of reproductive medicine, in my opinion. Today, IVF has gotten so good that most patients are actually rather easy to become pregnant. But there's one group that's difficult, that's very difficult, and they're so difficult that many fertility centers will not work with them because they think their prognosis is not good. And that's women who are older reproductively. And that's what we're talking about today. Is there finally hope for these women who have had no hope for so long? So I'm calling my seminar, Ovarian Rejuvenation Ultra Plus. And I'm very excited about the plus. And later in the webinar, I'll tell you what that means. But first, we're gonna start with some basic things. If you've watched one of my webinars before, I always like to show this slide because it shows you what we're facing and it provides the basis for everything else I'm going to talk about today. Now, if you look at the slide, you see that fertility 
progressively falls and it begins to fall even in the 20s and begins to fall more quickly at age 35 and then between the ages of 37 to 42 there's a marked fall and then after that it's as though it plummets it's as though fertility falls off a cliff after that time and it's in this area there's so many women so many couples would be amazing parents and they're unable to do so because they're on this slide and that's what we're trying to fix that's what ovarian rejuvenation is all about and at the same time fertility is falling look at miscarriage rates they go up and up and up so by the mid 40s miscarriage rates are nearly 100 percent so you work so hard you do these various techniques and you get pregnant and then you miscarry. And so that's what this is about. We need ways of reversing that. We need ways that people in this situation can have the baby that they desire. So what happens with eggs over the course of a woman's life? When her mother is 20 weeks pregnant with her, she has five to seven million eggs. But by the time she's born, she's down to one million eggs just in 20 weeks. Every month, she loses 11,000 eggs. That's one estimate, 11,000 eggs a month. It doesn't matter if she's pregnant, if she's on birth control pills, it doesn't matter what's going on. She loses all these eggs every month. By the time she has her first period, she's down to 300,000 eggs. And then a little bit over the age of 50, she goes through menopause. And what that means is she's out of eggs or has very few eggs left. So over the course of a woman's life, she only releases around 420 eggs. And that's only if she never gets pregnant or does not take birth control pills or anything like that. So there's only a very small group of eggs that are available to give the woman the baby she desires. Now, what are follicles? Now, any of you that uh, have gone through infertility before are well aware of follicles. Whenever an ultrasound is done, the fertility special, specialist measures the follicles. And they tell you how large it is and they tell you how many follicles they are, how many follicles there are on the screen. And so what a follicle is, is an egg with some cells around it. And the number of cells varies over time. And once it has some fluid in it, it's called an antral follicle. And that's what we see here. Then it becomes a mature egg, and then later the egg is released. Now, just as eggs fall over time, of course, follicles fall over time. And I like this slide because it shows this cliff that I was referring to. And this cliff actually begins a little later than this slide shows, but uh, on average, it's usually in the early 40s, and then you have this marked fall in fertility. And follicles are very important because follicles are the things that make AMH. And again, if you've been doing infertility or reading about infertility, you're going to see AMH. And when you go to see a fertility specialist, they say, what was your AMH? Or we're going to measure your AMH. Well, AMH is made by follicles. It's made by small follicles. It's made by follicles that are two to six or two to eight millimeters in size. And so if you have very few follicles left, if you started that downward slide, that AMH level is going to fall and it doesn't need to happen in the early 40s. It can happen at any time during your life. And we'll discuss situations like that in a few minutes. So the lower your AMH, the fewer small follicles that you have, and it decreases with age. And here's the key, AMH's job, one of its jobs is to actually protect the eggs, to protect the follicles. And so as AMH levels fall, you begin to lose eggs at an even greater rate. So AMH really is essential. And it's what we use to evaluate how well ovarian rejuvenation has done. Because as that level goes up, that means that you have more follicles, which means you have more eggs. And when you have more eggs, especially when you're older reproductively, your pregnancy rate is increased. Unfortunately, many fertility specialists use AMH as an excuse to exclude patients from therapy. So I know fertility specialists that say, we don't work with anyone under one. 
I know a couple of others that don't work with anyone under two. And let me tell you, everybody, almost everybody becomes pregnant when you're over two. So they say, look, our pregnancy rates are very high, but they're not working with the patients that really need it. The ones that need special care in order to become pregnant and not only to become pregnant, but to have a baby. So as you would expect, AMH falls with age as well. And you can see the marked drop in AMH, but you can also see with these lines that go up and down through the, 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 the various dots along those lines that there's a great deal of variation in AMH over age. And so a woman who's actually in her, let's say 40 years old can have an extremely low AMH or she can have an excellent AMH and her chance of success is very different in those two circumstances. So this clearly is the most challenging area of fertility. And it's called low ovarian reserve or low antral follicle count, many different names for it. But what it means is very few eggs, in the end, few or no good quality embryos. And if there is an implantation, a high miscarriage rate. So this is what the remainder of this webinar is about. Now, it appears that nothing seems to help. For many years, that was true. Lots of things have been tried. Numerous different protocols have been used with the idea that if we do things exactly right, the quality of the egg will be improved. But one of the things to remember is that generally, when an egg is found to be genetically abnormal later, it's because the egg, before stimulation ever started, the egg was abnormal. And so that's why you have to do special things to get to the correct time in order to care for that egg and give it a chance. Also growth hormone of course is used and uh, DHEA, many different supplements, but nothing's ever been proven to work or it'll work in a patient here and a patient there. But when you do controlled studies, you don't see any benefit to any of these types of treatments. What does rejuvenation mean? It means to make young again to restore to a former state, to make fresh or new again. Clearly, that's what we need to do. We need to take the ovaries and rejuvenate them. We need to have rejuvenated eggs, ones that can actually give you a genetically normal embryo that can give you a healthy baby. So how do we do rejuvenation? Well, it involves the ovary, doesn't it? Because, because that's where the follicles are. That's where the eggs are. And so what happens in the ovary? That's where eggs are developed and they're maintained and they're grown within the ovary. The ovary also creates hormones and those include AMH and testosterone and estradiol and progesterone and many other uh, hormones that are related to these hormones. So most people view their ovaries or uterus kind of as an enemy because it's, it's one of those two areas they think that are keeping them from becoming pregnant. But I really like this slide because the ovaries actually, the uterus and ovary are actually wonderful places. And if you do the right things for them, they're the thing that actually is the source of life. This is a slide that shows the pelvic organs. And you can see the uterus here in the center and you can see the fallopian tubes, which later attach to the ovaries. And then within the ovaries, you can see these structures here, which are actually eggs in the process of maturing. So if we look at the ovary more closely, we see that there are these primary follicles and these growing follicles, these are quite immature and they stay this way for many years until they begin the process of maturation during a fertility cycle. At some point, they accumulate this fluid. And that's what it's called an antral follicle. And I showed you that earlier. And then eventually they get large enough and the egg becomes mature enough that it's released. Now, the thing I want you to note is that the follicle is at the edge of the ovary because of course the egg is released out of the ovary and then it's picked up by the fallopian tube. So when you're doing the kinds of procedures we're going to discuss, you can see where it is that you want to inject the various solutions. You want to inject it on the outside of the ovary because that's where the eggs are. That's where the follicles are. What happens in the middle of the ovary is the production of hormones. 
So ovarian rejuvenation, of course, involves the blood. Now, what does the blood do? Of course, it supplies oxygen and nutrition to various cells around the body. It also moves hormones from one area to another. For example, the hypothalamus pituitary are the most important outside areas to create hormones when it comes to the ovaries or the testes. But it also is involved in the renewal of cells, of tissues. It heals injuries. So let's look at what's in blood that actually does this. And all areas, I mean, each of these cells have play some role in this, but the most important role is that of the platelet. And so the other thing to look at is plasma. Plasma is the fluid portion of blood. Let's look at what platelets do a little more. Now, first of all, they create clots to stop bleeding. And so for many years, that's what we thought platelets primarily did. There was bleeding, there was an injury, a platelet went and the platelet stopped the bleeding. But it turns out, although that's very important, that that's just the first step. Platelets are actually activated by injury. And when they're activated, they release growth factors. And when they release these growth factors, some of them actually stimulate stem cells in the area to begin to develop and differentiate into the various cells that are needed in order to regenerate that tissue. When you cut your arm, it's the platelets that go, stop the bleeding, and then they direct the reconstruction of the injury that you had to your arm. And one of the most important things that they do when they, when they are in this healing process is create new red bloods. I mean, I'm sorry, new blood vessels, because of course, when you're injured, blood vessels are cut and they're injured and you have to repair those in order to have normal tissue. Now, here's a slide of platelets. Now, don't think that the platelets are these brown structures here. Now, actually the platelets are these purple structures in the background. They're actually quite small and they're very unassuming. And as I mentioned for a long time, we're not taken seriously, I think in part because they were small. It turns out they are incredibly powerful. So let's look at this slide. We start with platelets here at the bottom. And once you activate the platelets, you can see all these growth factors that are released. And these growth factors, this is one concept, actually cause ovarian stem cells to grow and develop and become an egg. And this gives us a closer view of that. So here's ovarian stem cells, here's platelet-rich plasma and the growth factors that are released by the activated platelets. And you can see these cells progressively grow and differentiate until they become an egg. So this is one potential way that platelet-rich plasma may be helpful. There are other ways too that we'll discuss here in a few minutes. So platelet-rich plasma has been used for approximately 30 years. It's used in virtually every area of medicine. It's well known whether or not the risk, benefits, everything is quite well known because of its extensive use in these areas. And one of the latest ones you may have seen is for people with hair loss. And in each case, the purpose of using the platelet-rich plasma is to take advantage of the healing benefits, the healing effects of platelets. How is PRP, how is it generated? Well, you simply collect blood, then you isolate the platelets, you activate them, and then you inject them. And so after the procedure is done, what you have is you have different layers. One layer is platelet poor plasma, so it's plasma, but with very few platelets. And you have an area with platelet-rich plasma, and then you have the red blood cells. Of course, the area that we're interested in when we do ovarian rejuvenation is this area that has the platelet-rich plasma. I thought it'd be interesting to, to look at how it actually looks, or at least closer to how it looks. On the left, you see the blood after it's centrifuged, and in our case, we doubly centrifuge it. You, you see three layers here, and there's a plasma layer, and then there's the layer of platelet-rich plasma, and then there's red blood cells. So what actually happens is that we remove the area that has the platelet-rich plasma, and that's what we actually use to inject into the ovary. So PRP for ovarian rejuvenation. So it uses platelets from a woman's own body, not outside platelets. These platelets must be activated in order to release the growth factors. They're then injected into special places 
within the ovary, and we'll show that in a few minutes. You need to use ultrasound in order to watch the tip of the needle and make sure that the tip of the needle is exactly where it needs to be when the platelet-rich plasma is injected. And all of this is on a large screen in front of you. You actually can see this happen. You can actually see where the needle is. You can actually see the fluid being released from the end of the needle. And this takes roughly 15 seconds per ovary. In, in almost no case is there any significant discomfort at all and no anesthesia is required. So this is a very nice, very powerful procedure. Now, generation zero of ovarian rejuvenation was first reported in 2016. It involved using platelet-rich plasma and it involved general anesthesia because it was done using laparoscopy. It was done in Greece. That's where the original report came from. And there are still a few centers in this country that use generation zero. So they put the patient to sleep and then they either do laparoscopy or they do ultrasound transfer of the material, but it is under anesthesia. And that is a completely unnecessary risk in almost all cases. And some pr uh, pregnancies have been reported by other groups and many by our group. So generation one was actually a substantial advance. That's when we moved away from doing laparoscopy to inject the platelet-rich plasma to using ultrasound. As I mentioned before, with ultrasound, you see exactly where you are, so you can have precise placement of exactly the right amount of platelet-rich plasma into each part of the ovary. And of course, there's much less risk to patient without using a general anesthetic. And from now on, generation one forward, were first done by Gen 5 fertility physicians. So there are some in the US that are doing generation one. Unfortunately, most of those do use anesthesia in order to do it. Generation two was a huge advance in, in my view. And as we've looked at the results, it's dramatically improved over generation one. Generation two, is enriched platelet factors, that's what EPF stands for, or it's generally called MPLAF, again, enriched platelet factors. This was done first by Gen 5 fertility physicians, and it involves placing the growth factors, not the platelets, but the growth factors into the same areas of the ovary. Now, when you do, when you inject the platelets, you're counting on those platelets to continue to release growth factors for some time after you inject them. That's not true with generation two. With generation two, we take the platelets, we put them in an incubator and we let, we activate the platelets and then we let them release growth factors. Then we isolate the growth factors and it's the growth factors that we inject, not the platelets. Once again, we use ultrasound guidance a very thin needle, no anesthesia is required. Now here's the important point. When you inject growth factors instead of injecting platelets, the concentration of the growth factors is 10 to 15 times higher. So the ovaries get a jolt and they tend to respond much more quickly than they do when PRP is injected. And so here, we're gonna look at the two situations. On the left is PRP, a platelet is activated, and then it's injected into the two ovaries. In the case of MPLAF, the platelet is activated, it's then incubated. And then the growth factors, which we, which we retrieve from around the platelets, are then injected into each ovary. So those are the two techniques for generation one and generation two. Recently, we started generation three, or what we called ultra. This is a patent pending technique. It is tricky to do, but the lab has done a wonderful job figuring out how to do this in a very effective way. So what we do is we take the PRP and we take the enriched platelet factors or MPLAF and we put them together and we inject them both at the same time. Once again, we inject them under ultrasound guidance. Once again, we inject them into the correct position to have the maximal effect within the ovary. We also do include some enhancements with, uh, with this combination treatment. And we have had extremely good success with this. Just in the first three or four weeks we did this, we had multiple pregnancies, and all of these were in women who had struggled to become pregnant for long periods of time before. 
So how do we actually do this? This graphic sh will show you. We place a probe in the vagina, we isolate, we identify the uh, ovary, and then we pass a needle into the ovary, and then we inject the either the platelets or the uh, enriched platelet factors or the combination in the case of Ultra, we inject it directly into multiple locations within the ovary. Now in this next slide, we, it's actually a moving graphic and you will see exactly how it's done. I think that showed quite well how it's actually done. And let me see here. Ah, but today, this is the surprise I told you about. Generation four, and I'm calling this ultimate. Before I tell you exactly what we're doing now, I'm going to go over who ovarian rejuvenation is for. And we're gonna look at what categories we're doing well with and what categories are much more difficult which categories actually need this more advanced technique in order to work effectively at a higher rate. So this is gonna take a few minutes, but the first group are women who have premature ovarian insufficiency called POI or POP, which means they have no periods at all. Their reproductive system appears to be shut down. These are young women. They're aged less than 40 years old, but they can be many different ages. In fact, I have a patient now who apparently has this and she's had it since she was 13 years old. Another group are those that make what appear to be a normal number of eggs. They actually take those eggs and they grow them to blastocyst, the stage at which they implant. But when they're tested, they're found to be genetically abnormal. Then there are women who have what's called premature menopause. And these are women that are usually 40 to 45 and they have a true loss of periods and eggs, but they simply do it early. Probably it's mainly genetic. You gotta be careful with that group because of course there are many different reasons to not have periods besides menopause. Then there's this big group, the most common group of, of women that we see, and they're age-related decline of ovarian response patients. And there are many different names for this. I mentioned this earlier, but resistance and insufficiency and poor reserve. There are lots of names. None of them are nice names. And we don't want to hear any of those names. And when you have one of these diagnoses, it's a very tough thing to deal with. And then there are women that are perimenopausal. These are women who have not stopped having periods entirely, but have irregular periods and are soon to be menopausal. And as I mentioned previously, that means one year without a period. And if you look in the ovaries, as, as has been done in the past, you see no eggs or very few eggs. So let's look at the next slide here. Now, if we look at the first group, the POI and POF group, this group responds very well to typical ovarian rejuvenation that I've shown you. 
And so this group, if you do that and you do the right things in terms of hormones, they have an excellent chance. Unfortunately, many fertility specialists do not give them a chance. They come in and even though they're 29 years old, because their FSH level is high and their AMH level is low, they say, I'm sorry, you're menopausal, you need to use an egg donor. But actually, if you do the right thing, these women get pregnant at very high rates, particularly if they have not had um, either of these particular syndromes for very long. So this is straightforward and what we're doing now, I think is absolutely fine. The inability to create genetically normal embryos, as I think back, it's hard to think of anybody who did not become pregnant with a baby who had this original diagnosis. Ovarian rejuvenation is extremely successful with them. Premature menopause, it depends on how you define this, but this area between 40 and 45, particularly 40 to 42, 40 to 43, they also respond well to ovarian rejuvenation. And we've had a number of pregnancies in that group as well. It's these last three categories that are much tougher. Now, some women that have age-related decline in fertility, they become pregnant rather easily after doing typical ovarian rejuvenation, but others do not. Others do not respond or they don't respond well, or they respond in terms of creating embryos and blastocysts. However, they're found to be abnormal. And then those that are perimenopausal or, or menopausal, these are very, very difficult group of women because they simply don't make eggs and they make very few eggs. Now we have women in their late forties and early fifties, and we're able to create, help them create eggs and to create embryos. Unfortunately, they're typically abnormal. So these three groups are the groups that I wanna be able to help. And these three groups are the groups toward which, which uh, generation four uh, is intended. Now there's a new category of medication supplement out and you probably have heard about this. And this, these are anti-aging medication. Now that sounds like voodoo and it sounds like bunk, However, it's not. These are actually being researched by some of the top universities in the world. And these particular medications or supplements have been shown in mice and more recently in humans to actually have similar effects. And if you think about it, the problem that we have in the age-related decline of fertility and in the perimenopausal and menopausal patients is age. And what we need to do is to be able to turn back the clock, to truly rejuvenate, to give them a chance. And so there's several of these compounds out there, but the one that, that, that is my favorite is called NMN. And going into details about how this works, we don't have time to do it, but we know that when something called CERT2, when levels, activity levels are increased, then ovarian activity appears to improve even when the, uh, the, when the female is older reproductively. Look at the bottom of this slide. On the far left-hand side, you can see baseline. And this is the quality of the embryo. And you can see if the quality of the embryo is low. This line indicates that. After two days after receiving the NMN, it begins to go up. There's seven days and then 28 days look, all of the ones with low embryo quality, egg quality, are now drastically improved. So what happened in this study is they took females that were essentially menopausal and they were able to return them back to an earlier stage where they were able to create normal eggs, normal embryos, and actually have progeny. The problem is that this study was done in mice not done in humans. However, there's no reason to believe, particularly based on other evidence that has looked at human responses to this medication, that humans can also not respond to this as long as they receive the right dose and they receive it in the right way. So this has become one of our routine now, one of our routine supplements, and I think it's critically important for any women that are in those three groups. And we have already seen excellent responses as a result of this medication. But this is not what generation four is about. That's one element of generation four. There are actually two other related compounds 
that seem to have a similar effect, that seem to be very powerful when it comes to reversing the aging process to some extent at least. And then there's an unrelated compound that we're looking at. And then finally, there's a fifth compound that we're currently studying to see if it will benefit as well. There's some evidence that it does. And so we're looking forward to all five of these compounds. And what we're going to do is put them together in a special way at the correct dosages based on the woman who's receiving it to give them a full benefit. I truly believe that it will be very rare for these women, the women who are in their late 40s, early 50s, to become pregnant and have a baby unless we're able to do this. So what I'm telling you about today is only a small vision of what I have planned for generation four in another two or three months. We're gonna have another one of these webinars and then I will let you know the other things that we have planned. So as it says here, we mix and match them depending on the specifics of that woman's medical situation. So how do we do it? We fully evaluate each patient. We need to understand why they're having trouble becoming pregnant. The diagnosis is critical. Many times the diagnosis we get from outside physicians and they come here is absolutely wrong. For example, I have a patient that I saw last week. She's young. As I recall, she's 31 years old and she had endometriosis. And they told her, you have POF, premature ovarian failure. But actually what she had was complete destruction of her ovaries by doctors that went in to treat endometriosis. And her eggs are largely gone. So she is not a POF patient and she is actually a patient that is in one of those latter three categories and needs to be treated in that way. We look at the AMH, we look at the FSH, we look at the antropolical count, whether or not a woman has periods, how often she has periods, whether or not the follicles indicate that they're making hormones, any surgery she's had in the past, as I just mentioned. So you have to understand exactly what's going on with that woman and exactly where she is in terms of her reproductive life in order to make the right decision for her about which of these medications or supplements to take. And in the case of perimenopausal or menopausal patients, it takes months, usually three months of treatment with these medications before you can hope to have any success. And so everything needs to be timed very carefully. It makes no sense with, uh, with these patients in these two groups to do ovarian rejuvenation injection and immediately start a cycle. It takes time to do it. And it takes more than just that injection. It takes the elements of generation four to give them a real chance. So this is actually our primary research and clinical focus here. As I mentioned before, it's become very easy to help patients, let's say under 37, 39 years old to become pregnant and have a baby. But above that, it's still very difficult. And the vast majority of fertility centers have never had a successful pregnancy in any woman 42 and over unless they used an egg donor. So we have many publications. I think it was six or seven in the past year. We just had another one accepted, accepted uh, in the past few days. And this is a study that looked at PRP versus enriched uh, platelet factors. We also do other special things for women in these categories, how we do the stimulation cycle, the dosages that we use, which medications we use at which time. All of those things are different. When we actually complete the cycle is different and how the eggs and embryos are managed in the lab. They actually change the conditions that the embryos from reproductively older women are in in order to grow the embryos in an optimal way. How and when we give the progesterone is different. How and when we give, we do the embryo transfer is also different. We've also created an entirely new way of doing PGS or PGTA, which is when the embryos are examined for chromosomal defects. We have an entirely new method that we use that gives women that are having those procedures a markedly improved chance of actually becoming pregnant and having a baby. So it's all of these things together that are necessary to give them the greatest possible chance. Here are several of the papers that we published. We place papers that are published, we put them on the website under research, 
you can access all of them there. You can read through them so you can understand what our thinking is. And if you're scientifically based, I think they're also quite interesting. So I'm showing four of them here, but we have many, many of these. In fact, we post these on Instagram and other places. We show what the, what the AMH was before the generation one, two or three technique and what it was after. And we'll just look at a few of them here. Uh, for example, in the upper right, it was point, it was 0 0.09 and went up to 0.737. So this is a dramatic increase. You remember I told you that 0.2 is important and we were able to get much more above 0.2, normal embryo, normal baby. And over here, we had an AMH that was 0 0.05 and went up to 0.56, went up 10 times. We have another patient that was 0 0.03, and after doing ovarian rejuvenation, it was 1.33. She created multiple normal embryos uh, in her 40s when she had never been able to do that before. Here's one that doubled from 0.55 to 0.98, and here's another one, 0.55 to 0.92. So they're, they're they're markedly different responses depending on the woman. Some of it depends on what her platelet count is. And there are other things that seem to influence how well she's going to respond to this. This shows you that in the initial US study, most of the patients were between 40 and 50 years old. This shows the increase in AMH after doing ovarian rejuvenation. This slide shows you that other things are improved as well. This is actually sexual response and because when you do PRP you see an improvement in hormone production that was increased as well. This is a, a, a patient that I mentioned earlier that had done seven cycles and it shows them here. You can see that she actually makes quite a nice number of eggs. Here's 12, 13, 10 but if you look over here you find you see that every every blastocyst that she made, even though she made several blastocysts in some of these cycles, everyone was abnormal. Down here, we did implant with her. She created a normal embryo. It was transferred. She became pregnant and uh, recently delivered. So does, do these techniques work for everybody? I don't know about generation four. I hope that with generation four, virtually everyone will respond, but we don't know yet. But no, not everyone responds to generation one, two, or three. But it does give women who had no chance, who had been told they have no chance, who believed they had no chance, it gives them a chance. And as you've seen, many, many babies have been born from women who were told the only thing you can do, your only option is to use an egg donor. There are just a lot of women that don't want to believe that, don't believe that, and it's nice that they have something that they can do that gives them a very real chance of markedly improving their AMH, markedly improving the number of, of eggs that they have, gives them a chance of actually having a baby. And as we've seen, each generation of ovarian rejuvenation so far has proven to be more effective. It is all about the egg, but the egg is all about the ovary. And so both generations one to three and generation four are both about improving conditions within the ovary, which then improve conditions for the egg and makes the egg more likely to be normal, which makes the embryo more likely to be normal. And then when you put a normal embryo in, it doesn't matter what age the woman is, the chance of it sticking and leading to a baby is very high. So what's the future? We now have generation three and four. And generation four, as you'll soon see, will be greatly expanded from what we're doing now. I have many ideas about how to make generation four the most uh, active, the most effective technique possible. We have another novel technique that we're working on, and we think that'll be available within uh, one to two years. We continue to publish papers. We're gonna continue to put them on the website so that you can see them there. So we're all working for a day when low ovarian reserve, when POP doesn't matter, having that diagnosis doesn't matter, that there are ways of helping these women. We want to end the current situation, which is where women, once they get over age 42, 43, have almost no chance of success. And everything I've talked to you about today is designed specifically for that situation or for younger women who unfortunately have diminished ovarian reserve for one reason or another. Here's a picture of our center. 
and you can see in the distance the Pacific Ocean. So it's an absolutely beautiful center. This is a reserve off to the left. It's a very peaceful place. It's a very fertile place. And of course, of course, life began with water. And so I love looking out the window. In fact, I'm right here now. I can look out and see the ocean and uh, we love our center. But what really matters are the babies. And the babies that you see here, these babies would not be here if it were not for fertility care. And uh, it's one thing to, to, to see a human as an egg or an embryo, which happens too often when you're in my field. It's a very different thing to see them walk in and you see how amazing they are and how each of them has a chance to do incredible things in their life. And this is what it's all about, the babies. Thank you very much for, for your time.